Hi, ghosties. I'm Macy. And I'm Natalie. And today we're talking about Dybbuk boxes, or really one in particular. Now, this is something that I have heard talked about for many years. You probably haven't. No, You're just not in this realm. during that one, um, I think it was like last year episode where they were talking about being in a cemetery and they brought a Dybbuk box. Yes. And I was like, what is that? Now we're exploring it. I've never actually known what it was. I kind of knew the premise mm -hmm. of what it was, but I, I didn't know the the exact you know yeah i knew it had something to do with darkness or a curse and i knew that people were selling them online that there were numerous <laughs> videos out there of people opening them up and the implications were never good like you're not supposed to open a dibic box because it'll release an evil spirit that's about all i knew okay i'm intrigued there's much more i'm honestly a little shocked at what i found and it left me questioning if anything like a dibic box could actually be real oh well i'm excited i'm really interested to hear what you have to say because this is different okay. <laughs> this one's a little different and I'm interested in the opinions of the council here. So yes. <laughs> let us know <laughs> what you know about Dibbit Boxes and what you think by the end of this. Our yep. tea. Our tea this week is our last of the festival teas that I bought. It's ocean a, ocean tea bag. It's apple. Cute little dog for so, the tea bag. So cute. Love it. All right. Well, let's go. surprise it's good i like it i've liked all of them you have i not which is interesting because like i think you said before you don't really like anything fruity, uh teas i know i usually only like the vanillas and the caramels and the you know fall type of vibes but i mean i guess apple is fall ish kind of but this one tastes more spring apple <laughs> yeah sense. no but it is good it is good all of the fruit ones just kind of taste like a fruit candy was dissolved in water. I feel like they're kind of reminiscent to like dehydrated fruit. Yeah. Like if you stuck a bunch of dehydrated fruit into this, which I guess that might, is probably what it is. Probably. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's, I, I taste like, you know, these bags of dehydrated apples. Yeah. I like it though. I'm pretty, pretty for good. it. It's pretty good. And we want to know what all of you are drinking. I've seen some of you have your tea with us. So let us know what kind of tea you drink and we'll probably steal your ideas. <laughs> yeah. Someone posted um, on Instagram. They were like, tea time with the girls. And I was like, that's exactly what I wanted. It yeah. makes me like cry. I love it. In the year 2003, while perusing through eBay, a great many patrons spotted a strange new posting. It looked to be an old wine cabinet. It was unassuming and had a little bit of damage around the two grape-shaped decals on the, each door. It was a regular old wine cabinet. The damage on the outside was nothing a person familiar with refurbishing furniture couldn't fix, but if you were intrigued enough to click on the listing, you would be met with a story so strange that you might think twice about putting in your bed. The seller, Kevin Manis, began his listing with, quote, All of the events that I am about to set forth in this listing are accurate and may be verified by the winning bidder with the copies of hospital records and sworn affidavits that I am including as part of the sale of this cabinet. Kevin claimed to have purchased the box in September of 2001 at an estate sale in Portland, Oregon. The previous owner was an old woman who recently passed at the age of 103, and he found that she was the only survivor of the Holocaust in her family by escaping capture in Poland and fleeing to Spain. And it was in Spain where she obtained the small wine cabinet, and it was one of the few items that she brought over with her when she immigrated to America. He learned after the sale from the old woman's granddaughter that this cabinet was no ordinary wine cabinet, but what her grandma used to call a Dybbuk box. Neither Kevin nor the granddaughter knew the meaning of the word, but the granddaughter knew that it was never to be opened. Her grandmother kept the Dybbuk box out of reach and sealed shut for all the years that she had possession. In fact, the grandmother wanted the box buried with her in order to keep the cabinet shut forever, but the family was unable to do so because it went against the rules for Orthodox Jewish burial. Even stranger, when Kevin attempted to return it to the granddaughter, as he felt it was too sentimental to take it from the family, and he even offered, like, no, keep the money, keep mm -hmm. the box, like, all of it. The granddaughter insisted that he take it with him and even shouted at him that the family did not want it and asked him to leave immediately. Knowing this interaction was strange to say the least, he left and took it with him to his furniture refinishing business in hopes of fixing it up and gifting it to his own mother. Just 30 minutes after leaving the box in the basement for the day, Kevin received a call from his lone salesperson working in the store that day. She was in hysterics, imploring him to return to the store because she was locked in with what sounded like an intruder down in the basement. When Kevin returned, however, Nobody but the salesperson was in the store, and the doors remained locked. So he walked up to the store. The, the front door was mm -hmm. sealed shut. No one was there. When he walked down into the basement, every single light bulb had been shattered, and he was overwhelmed by a strong scent of urine that had not been there when he left. Oh. His employee of two years left the store, never to return before he even made it back up the stairs. She was so scared. There was only one door, too. 
you could there was no way to get out of the basement he mm -hmm. said he never found a logical reason for any of the strange things that began happening on that day two weeks later kevin decides to get started on fixing up the so-called dibbit box for his mother like he initially intended this is the day he decided to open up the box for the first time what he finds inside perplexes him there were two u.s pennies from the 1920s a lock of blonde hair and a lock of dark brown hair both tied together with strings a small granite statue with the word shalom etched in hebrew which he didn't know that at the time he didn't he doesn't know hebrew mm -hmm. a dried rosebud a golden wine cup and a cast iron candlestick holder with octopus legs okay <laughs> all very strange interesting his mother's birthday was fast approaching so instead of refinishing the cabinet he decided to clean it up and give it to her as is after returning from a birthday trip she showed up at Kevin's shop on Halloween of 2001 to have her celebratory birthday lunch with her son. He handed her the gift, and she seemed as though she liked the cabinet. She was like, oh, wow, nice, thank you. That is until she began to have a stroke, <gasps> just a minute after touching the box. She was rushed to the hospital and luckily survived, but suffered greatly, including temporarily losing her ability to speak. The next day, when Kevin returned to the hospital to visit his mother, he found her with a print of the alphabet being the only way to communicate with. As he approached her, she began to spell out, N-O-G-I-F-T, no gift. He assured her that he did give her a birthday gift. He's like, no, mom, I did, you know, thinking maybe she'd just forgotten. Yeah. But she became very upset and spelled out H-A-T-E-G-I-F-T, hate gift. Even after this, Kevin still never associated the unfortunate events to be caused by the strange box he purchased at an estate sale just a month prior. He instead gave the cabinet to his sister, who only kept it for a week because the doors would not stay closed no matter what she did. He never had this problem either. He was like, mm. the mechanism works properly. Like, it's fine to stay closed for me. He thinks everybody else is just having issues. Yeah. Then he gave it to his brother and sister-in-law, who only kept it for three days because the sister-in-law insisted it smelled too strongly of cat urine. Oh. His brother kept smelling the scent of jasmine, though. So they kind of had Weird. two different experiences. He attempted to give it away a fourth time to his girlfriend, who only kept it for two days before she asked if he could just sell it at his shop. He was able to sell it to a middle-aged couple, but even they returned it back to him after owning it for only a few days. They left it at the front door of his shop before he opened with a note attached that read, This has a bad darkness. So he decided he should just take it back home with him. Oh, well, why? I know, right? Like, everybody is having issues with it, and he's like, oh, I'll just take it to my house. Also, I think Kevin has a dark side. <laughs> he's just trying to give it to He's everybody. giving it to everyone he claims to care about. He's like, oh, this is this caused a stroke. Here, sister. <laughs> oh, she doesn't want it. Here, brother. Like, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> I mean, he claims that he didn't think, he didn't connect them. Mm. Like, if it was happening day after day, then that would make sense, I guess. But I can see if it's like, you get it this first week. The weird thing happens and then several weeks later you're like oh here mom she has a stroke you're you're caught up in your mom's illness so you don't even think about the other two and like the fact that it might be connected especially if you're not really into the paranormal okay i was about to say well maybe that would just be me like i would immediately be like it's the box like yeah. ah yeah so no me too <laughs> okay but i don't know we need to keep an eye on kevin so he takes it home with him and that is when the nightmares begin from the day that he decided to bring the dipic box to his home he began having horrendous nightmares of an old demonic hag that beats him mercilessly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's horrid. The worst part of these dreams is that upon waking, he'd find bruises and marks all over his body where the old woman had hit him in his dreams. And even worse, if that's possible, he found that his sister, his brother, his sister-in-law, and his girlfriend all had the same nightmares while they were in possession of the Dybbuk box. Oh, this is dark. Yeah. He had his brother and his sister-in-law over for a weekend. He started talking about his dream and the brother was like, whoa, I had the same dream last night. And the sister-in-law was like, me too. I didn't want to talk about it because I was so scared. The brother was like, you know, I had those dreams a few weeks ago too when we had the box. And the sister-in-law also did. So they called their sister and she was like, yeah, I oh. had the same dreams. And then he called his girlfriend and she was like, I mean, I've had a dream like that before, but I don't know when. And he was like, could it be when you had the box? He was like, yes, that's exactly when. I don't like this at all. From then on, he began seeing shadows in his peripheral vision, and the smoke alarms would go off in the middle of the night inside the storage shed he kept in the cabinet. The final breaking point for Kevin was when he brought the box back inside and woke to someone breathing down his neck, but nobody else was in the house. When he woke up to this sensation, not only did he smell the scent of jasmine flowers, but also saw a very large shadow traipse down his hallway away from him. So that's when he decided to place the so-called Dybbuk box for sale. He wanted to rid himself of the cabinet and hopefully also rid himself of all of the unfortunate events that had been occurring. And it sold. <gasps> Ooh, we'll get to that. Okay. So before we move on to the next victim of the Dybbuk box, I wanted to talk a little about this. So 
As I said in the intro, I have heard about Dybbuk boxes, but mostly in passing, and it was never in great depth. So I thought it was time to do a little deep dive on Dybbuk's. I do want to say, whenever I was imagining this, I was thinking something no, no bigger than like that mug. Like I wasn't thinking a wine cabinet. How big are we talking wine cabinet? Oh, he listed the dimensions on the posting. Let me see if I can find it one second. I was picturing like a small little trinket box. Yeah, like a little treasure box kind of thing. Yeah, like things I used to like to have. Mm -hmm. No, it's much bigger. I mean, it holds wine. So let me see the dimensions here. He said the measurements are 12 and a half inches by seven and a half inches by 16.25 inches. Okay, so it's not huge, it's but not it's huge. like a sizable little thing. Little case. Yeah, it's like a, yeah. Interesting. Because that's not exactly portable. I thought that they had to be able to be carried around. I don't know why. I mean, it can be. It's just uncomfortable to carry. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> it's bigger than I thought too, because when I first uh, heard of Dybbuk Box too, I thought, Especially because that story. Yes, last in the year. cemetery, the little trinket box mm -hmm. is what I was imagining. Yeah. But then you said there was a octopus candlestick and a goblet and hair, and I was like, oh my god! Yeah. At first, when you said that, I was thinking like a huge like china cabinet. And oh, I was like, that's much they're bigger. They're huge. So let's start with the beginning. What is a dybbuk? The term dybbuk originates in Jewish mythology, first written about in the 16th century by Jewish mystic Rabbi Isaac Luria. They are the spirits or souls of people who have committed serious sins and did not repent before passing. They are stuck in a spiritual limbo where they remain tormented by avenging angels and evil spirits unless they are able to find a person in which they can possess and cling to for its own safety. It's believed that a Dybbuk requires a human host to possess, and once possessed, the host changes at once. The word Dybbuk actually comes from a word that means to cling. Oh. So it's a kind of the darkest part of someone's soul once they pass. Oh, this is, this is getting scary. It gained more popularity in the early 1900s when S. Ansky wrote a play titled The Dybbuk, in which a woman is possessed by her deceased fiancé the night before her wedding to a new man. It reminded me a little of demonic possession, because the possessed will often become more vulgar and lewd in their speech and actions, kind of similar to what people uh, demonically possessed do. They won't be able to enter their synagogue, touch any holy books or texts, or even interact with rabbis or deeply spiritual people. This is sounding very demony. One source said, quote, previously well-mannered pious people were suddenly vile, cruel, and overtly sexual aggressors. So just very, very intense. Well, I mean, it is the darkest part of whatever person. Mm -hmm. There were rules to determine whether someone was possessed by a Dybbuk, which included acting against their own will, speaking in a language they hadn't spoken prior, performing acts that they were unable to before, and even violent convulsions. Oh. And it's said that the convulsions happen upon entrance and exit. The possessed remains conscious, but is incredibly distressed. They are also more often female than male, and it requires special means to expel the Dybbuk from their person. People suffering from any nervous or mental disorder were taken to a rabbi to expel the Dybbuks through exorcism. So very similar. Okay. Uh, yeah. Very, very similar. It's just like the Jewish version, kind of, of versus the Catholic, Catholic demon. Yeah. yeah. But I'm very intrigued because it's not like it was a, a demon already. It was just a person. Yeah, it was a person. So, it's a human soul. I don't know if that's scarier. So I found an image of writings dating back to the 18th century, supposedly detailing Dybbuk's and Dybbuk exorcism from a woman in their community. As we've made abundantly clear, I only speak English. So <laughs> I just trust the source in which I found it that they're telling me the right things because it was written in a different language. I'm okay. assuming Hebrew. But the young woman was possessed by the spirit of her deceased husband. The rabbis got together and performed an exorcism like the some of the rabbis and more spiritual people in the community that they live. The act of exorcism of a Dybbuk, though not really performed much anymore, it's not really a thing today. It was similar to that of a Catholic exorcism. Mm -hmm. The possessed would be assessed to determine if the victim was not merely suffering from psychotic depression, sleep deprivation, or other physical or emotional symptoms. Then a group of 10 Jewish, um, like pious people, most of the time it was men, would gather around preparing themselves to deal with the spirit. They had some rituals and things that they had to do to prepare, prepare themselves for this battle, basically. Yeah. They would gather typically in a synagogue and either a rabbi or deeply pious person so not just a rabbi could perform this. So someone who is deeply religious and pious mm -hmm. could. They would speak directly to the Dybbuk and list the spirit's sins during life. Sometimes the Dybbuk was believed to be a person who had passed from their own community. So they would know, hey, this is Joe who passed a few weeks ago. Hey, these were your sins in life. Get Repent out. and get out. Kind <gasps> of. Oh my to, my, to my understanding, obviously... I am not of this religion. I don't tr like know all the ins and outs of all this. I'm just saying what I've read. Uh -huh. 
The whole goal of the exorcism was to find a way in which to coax the spirit from the afflicted person by finding a way to help the soul cross over. They have to know the name of the Dybbuk, and if they won't give up their name, if they don't already know, and they won't give up the name, then they would sometimes use smoke or sulfur to coax the Dybbuk to give up their name. I'm not sure. The... Sulfur. That's interesting, because isn't that the smell that people smell? Oh, that like... smelly smell. <laughs> when people <laughs> smell, it's like a demon, happen, like a possession? Some people have said that, yeah. Once they were able to get the Dybbuk to leave, they could help redeem the soul or force it to enter hell. <gasps> oh, that okay. That's the source. Okay, so if they're not forcing them, you know, to the depths, where do they go then? Just they, out to find their way? Yeah, depends on who you talk to. So there are different people who believe different things. I think they just, to help them cross over, so they help them repent of their sins and find their way to where they're supposed, where to, be. They're supposed to be. Okay. So the origins of the Dibbit box seem to be Kevin Manis and his eBay post. <laughs> many, <laughs> yeah, many have rightfully so been skeptical about this mysterious box that apparently holds an entity that has only been known to attach itself to people rather than objects. So most people will say, no, Dibbit's can only attach itself to another person. The soul can only attach itself to another soul kind mm -hmm. of thing or body, I guess. His story and the stories of its subsequent owners blew up and were actually the inspiration for a movie made in 2012 called The Possession. And the entire exchange with this particular box were, at the very least, interesting. So if it's not truly a Dybbuk box or whatever they mm -hmm. call it, it's still interesting to talk about. Kevin was able to sell his Dybbuk box in June of 2003 to a college student from Missouri named Iosif Nitschke, I think. That's mm -hmm. his name. Or I think that's how you say his name. Referred to him some sources as Joseph. So I'll probably just call him Joseph. He sold it for $140. He still wanted money for it? I would just be like, you want it? Take it. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. still trying to make a make a profit? Well, he, I mean, he had a bid. He's like, mm -hmm. I didn't, he didn't put any, um. Oh yeah, eBay. Okay. Yeah, it was eBay. He didn't put any low, like the lowest he'll take amount. He was mm -hmm. just like, bid. If you want it, you can have it. Okay. There was also um, one source that I read that said his shop got closed down like soon after he bought it or something like that. So he just was just struggling. Yeah. yeah. So maybe he needed the money. I mean, hey, get your bag. He received the box and all of its contents by mail, but it wasn't long after this that the haunted box ended up listed on eBay once more. He claimed to have nothing but bad luck from the day the big box arrived on his doorstep. Everything from foul odors in his house, a bug infestation, electronic and vehicular malfunctions, and shadow figures in his and his roommate's peripheral vision. He and his roommates had bouts of illness and insomnia as well. Oh my gosh, the bugs would have been enough for me. He said, quote, We have definitely seen a tidal wave of bad luck. Most disturbingly, last Tuesday, my hair began to fall out. I'm in my early 20s, and I just got a clean blood test back from the doctors. So his <laughs> hair was falling out due to the stress of having this, due to the bad luck. It's unsure. That is like one of the most personal attacks I've ever heard. Ending his post with, quote, For personal reasons, I very strongly do not want this box anymore. I hope there's someone on eBay that will take this thing off my hands. I would just throw it away in the woods or something, but I know there's been some interest in it in the past. In the woods? Just How dare you, Joey? That's rude. <laughs> That's rude. You know how I feel about the woods already? And then you come up upon this strange box and you're like, Oh, cool. Wow, what Free I need fine. wine cabinet take this home and refurbish it and then you're cursed and you're bald <laughs> i don't you like call that. him joey oh <laughs> joseph sorry so on february 9th of 2004 the box was sold again for double his money 280 dollars to another kirksville missouri resident jason haxton jason haxton was the director of the museum of osteopathic medicine in kirksville at the time and actually heard about the dybbuk box from one of his student employees who was one of nitsky's roommates interesting he described himself at the time as science-based, and he wasn't really sure if he believed in the stories, but he was intrigued. I like when people that aren't fully invested in it will or so they partake, say. you know, just because if you're a little bit skeptical, I feel like that's like me. I don't. So you relate fully. Like, I'm not going to be like, oh, it's a ghost. It's a this. It's a that. But I, so I could me. be convinced. <laughs> yes. You're not me. I could be convinced. And I like the science-based approach. Like, hmm, maybe it's this i don't know what science would cause you to go bald because a cabinet but yeah <laughs> i don't know why i'm stuck on the balding that's like the least of our worries but that's true i just think it's kind of funny because it's very uh like real like you can see it it has no explanation so it's weird like if you your car breaks down you're like okay well you know cars break down mm -hmm. if you get a bug infestation okay sometimes bugs come in your house you know but if you go bald for no reason you're like what <laughs> what's happening you know that's true that's true so i get it i get the, the fixation on the on the bald so he purchased the box from joseph to give to a friend but the friend refused to take it so i think the friend was like an illusionist or something and he's mm. like oh my friend could use this you okay know? almost immediately the effects took place 
The next day after having it in hand, Haxton woke to a swollen right eye with seemingly no explanation. It looked like it had been poked like very, very hard. Oh my God. It was just swollen and red. He went on to get welts all over his body, began feeling extreme fatigue and constantly ill and had a strange metallic taste. He too would occasionally smell the odors of cat urine and flowers at different times and had the similar nightmares to previous owners of an evil old woman. He ended up taking the box to a lab to have it tested. He thought maybe there were heavy metals like mercury or some other toxin that could be causing all of his health issues. That's a good, that's a good uh, guess. Everything came back negative. Oh, <laughs> yeah, great. There was no reason that Haxton could deduce for his ailments after receiving the box. Mm -hmm. And it all stemmed from receipt of the, the box. The day he got the box. That's when he began his research. He interviewed the previous owners of the box to compare their experiences. He then began research on Divix, talking to rabbis and other professionals ranging from science to spiritual studies. He then compiled a website detailing everything and it became wildly popular. So the link to the website on all of my sources was broken. Aww. So I, I couldn't find the website. Mm -hmm. It might be out there. Maybe I'm spelling it wrong or something. He had hundreds of people contacting him about the box at this point. Some wanted to help to figure out the mysterious box with him. Others just wanted to purchase it for who knows why. And he never sold it because he felt it unethical to bring this upon someone else. I was going to say from the start. I mean, part of me is like, yeah, sell it. Like, make a big profit. Like, just make people go wild about it. But then I was going to say, that's not very nice. You're knowing that this is going to ruin someone's life, but you're like... $10,000 $10,000. <laughs> well, I mean, it's only $100 the well, first one. Well, if people get, if there's a lot of yes, yes, yes. excitement around it, some people will oh, yeah. spend the money. Oh, yeah. Especially paranormal investigating people. And that's who I would sell it to. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'd just sell it to some random person on the internet. Like, I would need proof that they deal in these kinds of things mm -hmm. and have a collection of their own and know how to protect themselves and stuff like that. Because I would feel so awful if I knew that I brought this upon somebody yeah. else yeah that's someone who un unsuspecting someone who thinks oh it's not real or oh i can handle it and they've never done anything like this you know agreed he even claimed that one woman even begged him to take the images of the box off of his website because she feared it would create a portal to anyone's life who saw the photos <laughs> and i've heard stories about that too yes about the dibic box but other things like people will see an image of a haunted doll and be haunted things like that just speaking the words the name of some of these objects will cause peril in someone's life no <laughs> i rebuke no, you no it won't <laughs> because it can't or i will you'll never hear from us again <laughs> yeah i feel that we're fine i feel like we know what we're doing for the most part i know what i'm doing for the most part i know or i feel like i know how to protect myself and if ever the need arises there are people to call to, for help and hopefully that need never comes you got their number because i don't i'll find them okay the internet is a vast place <laughs> that makes me feel like those text chains used to get oh, it's like send yes, this to 10 yes. people or she'll come to your room i mean I always did as we've stated previously oh, yes. i'm gonna send it to 10 people but yes. it gives you that same feeling yeah it's like oh, help yes oh i don't want to see any photos actually i was gonna ask to see but oh i brought photos <sighs> okay I'll you don't look. have to look. I'll look for a sec i'll look like this okay so i don't really see just it. through the through the little slit in your hand mm -hmm. Now that'll keep him away. Yep. It works for all the scary movies I watch. <laughs> he finally received an answer from a rabbi to help him rid of whatever evil plagued him. He was told to put the cursed wine cabinet into a gold-lined wooden container, and that would cancel out the evil within. So I don't know if there's some properties of gold that I don't know about that kind of negates evil spirits. I don't know. I would try it. It's possible. He did as he was told, and he claims all of his illnesses and bad luck subsided. From oh. that moment on, he just stopped. In fact, he went as far as saying he felt as though the prayer had been answered and the Dybbuk's unfinished business was finished. Oh. He believed the box's energy maybe even reversed and was more so a good luck charm for him after that point. Some sources claim that Haxton called it his personal fountain of youth because he felt better and his labs, like his doctor's labs, were better than he was like 10 years before. That's very interesting. But it still doesn't feel right. Right. Yeah. Haxton kept the box buried in an undisclosed location while he wrote a book and was approached by other authors, screenwriters, and documentary crews wanting to take a closer look at the box. He eventually sold the rights to the story of the famed Dybbuk box to the production company of the film The Possession, which was made in 2012. I, I never saw it. I, I don't think I have, but as much as we're saying The Box, I'm thinking about the movie Seven. <gasps> What's in What's the, box? the box? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Finally, Haxton sold the wine cabinet turned Dybbuk box to none other than Zach Baggins who now displays it at his museum in Vegas. <gasps> Zach kept it at his museum, shut tight and on display, surrounded by salt as protection. 
He claimed that upon placing it in the museum, he and his staff began to notice mysterious holes appearing in the walls around the box. It seemed to him as if something was trying to break out from within the exhibit. I was going to say it's trying to get out, but it's in the sea bear circle and it can't get out. <laughs> Zach, his museum staff, and some of his visitors have spotted black shadows in and around the room with the box. There has been feelings of anger, anxiety, sickness, and even fainting related to the box inside the museum. Post Malone visited the museum and claimed that the box had cursed him with a string of bad luck in his life. While in Vegas, he approached the Dybbuk box with Baggins. Baggins touched the box for the first time. I don't think he had actually handled the box with his bare hands yet. And he touched it and Post Malone's hand was on his shoulder and he felt like the curse kind of transferred to him. And it affected him for a while. So while in the air on an airplane, the tires blew out suddenly, causing an emergency landing. So like they were mid-flight and the tires exploded. Terrifying. Because how did they land? Oh my God. I'm Love sure Post Malone, heroin. by the way. I, I also like him, yeah. Then his previous home was broken into. The robbers attacked those currently living there and were supposedly looking for Post Malone. They knew that that's oh, where he had lived. That's so sad. I would he feel so bad. had just missed it, yeah. Oh, I would feel so guilty, even though it's not my fault. I would yeah. feel so guilty. Lastly, he was in a car accident that totaled his Rolls Royce. Luckily, he wasn't injured, but the wreck was pretty bad. It like completely totaled his car and the other person's car. Hey, well, as long as he's okay, I'm, yes. I can deal with getting rid of a car. Post Malone believed the Dybbuk box was to blame for his spate of bad luck. This is insane. Eventually, Zach decided to open the box. He claimed to have captured on camera a mist that was coming from it once he opened it. A dark shadow or entity was also spotted, quote, crouching down toward the wall behind the box. Something about crouching. I don't like it. Oh, gross. They all felt ill and uneasy with the box, particularly when it was opened. And the box still remains at the museum, as far as I know, and Zach Baggins claims that there are other boxes out there. So he believes that there are actually 10 Dybbuk boxes in the world, each one aligning to the Tree of Life concept from Kabbalah, the basis of Jewish, Jewish mysticism. So that's what he thinks. He thinks there are 10 coinciding with the Tree of Life. That's interesting. Zach claims to own two of them, and he thinks that eight of them have been found, and there are two still missing out in the world. He also believes that all of the evil from the 20th century, like all of the wars and destruction and awful things that happened in the 26th century, are contained within the tin boxes. And if they are all open, then it could summon the evil. So why are they opening the box? <laughs> I don't know. There are plenty of boxes online claiming to contain Dybbuk for sale. Are any of them real? That's anyone's guess. I'd say probably not, <laughs> but you never truly know. Yeah. Also, Jason Haxton says that there is only one Dybbuk box. So his, so Zach's um, theory for the tin is, Jason says is not true. There's only the one box. But how do we know? We don't. I feel very strange. Anything? This is getting too too modern for me. It's just too modern. I like when we say like, oh, in the 1850s. Okay, in the I have a question about that. What? What is the difference between a modern haunting and an ancient haunting? If it's ancient, it doesn't feel as real. Okay. Because. Oh, so it's getting too close to home kind of feeling. Yes. Ah, okay. Well, this next part might be good for you. Okay. Here's where we get to the surprising piece. We're okay. the I'm piece already surprised. Me. I didn't know post. <laughs> I didn't know we were ever going to talk about Post Malone on the pod. <laughs> that seems very Out strange there, yeah. to me. Well, this is a surprising piece to me. In 2019, Kenny Biddle, for his column for Skeptical Inquirer Online, went to the Vegas Museum to take a closer look at the so-called Dybbuk box. He surmised, quote, Despite what various owners would have us think, the infamous Dybbuk box is not a Jewish wine cabinet from Spain, but instead a mini bar from New York. He believed that Kevin Manis made the entire backstory up and just found a creative way to sell a piece of furniture. The real kicker is that in a post dating back from 2015, supposedly Kevin Manis posted on the Haunt Me Facebook page, quote, I am the original creator of the story of the Dybbuk box, which appeared as one of my eBay posts back in 2003. If you or anyone else can find any reference to a Dybbuk box anywhere in history prior to my eBay post, I'll pay you $100,000 and tattoo your name on my forehead. He also supposedly reiterated the statement again and ever since uh, 2021. Maybe it's just because he's scared. Maybe. Or maybe he made it up. <laughs> I feel betrayed. <laughs> That's how I felt too. I was like, no! I don't know how I feel now. I was totally invested and I was here for, I was- Believe in it, yeah? Yeah, I did too. There's more, sort of. My thoughts anyway. So maybe this particular cabinet wasn't haunted after all. It is simply a piece of internet lore created by a writer wanting some fun and to offload himself on a uh, rundown box. Hmm. Who knows? It's possible. Then we have the question whether or not the three subsequent owners continued with the legend to further it for fun, mm -hmm. maybe money. I don't want to discount this theory because stranger things have been done for money, so. That is true. 
That is very true. Also, the power of suggestion is very... Yes. Is very... Strong. Yes. I agree. Where I land with this is with another set of questions. One, is it possible to trap a demon or a dark soul in a box? I say maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I've read about demon traps from Babylonian times and even something called a jinn trap placed in the corners of people's homes to capture jinns, which are like Islamic demons and like mm-hmm. demons in the Middle East and mm-hmm. stuff. To my understanding, I need to do a deep dive on jinns. People have suggested it too. I have it I on the list. I was about to say, someone said that. Yeah, I have it on the list. But to my understanding, that's what they are. They're basically like demons. There were even the priests in Germany at Feldsea Lake when we talked about the Black Forest uh-huh. who threw their bottled up spirits yeah. into the lake. Obviously, I believe objects can be haunted. So why can't you trap a dark spirit within an object as well? Yeah, I think so. Is that where you land too? I think so, yeah. But my second question remains unanswered for me. Is it possible to create a haunting for yourself? I think if you believe something strong enough, it will be true. You can manifest it yourself? I think so. Which, that's I, what some people believe poltergeists are, are just a manifestation of someone's like psychic power, or unknown psychic oh. power. But continue. Okay. No, I mean, I just, I believe that you can make anything true if you really believe it. I mean, hit me. I'll believe if you're anything. you're delusional enough. <laughs> I'll believe anything that I come up with. Yes, 100%. Okay. And so I think that if you want to be haunted, you're going to be, I think. Okay. Which I don't, for the record. I don't want to be haunted. Okay, ever, so by it anything. won't happen. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. See, I land kind of in the middle. I'm not sure. People creating lore and just f- for fun stories and hauntings yeah. and things. That's like the black eyed children thing. Some dude just wrote it he just made it up but then people Maybe. claim that they've seen it mm-hmm. so I, I don't know so it's the same thing is it it's, the, it's a piece of internet lore are people believing it so much that it's becoming real or to them at least like yeah. they're seeing it but it's not you know yes I, I get you <sighs> could it be that the purchasers of the wine cabinet turned to big box poured their negative energy and misfortune mm. into this box Maybe they were having bad luck at the beginning of their ownership. Just just happened coincidentally, yeah. which I don't believe in a coincidence. Yeah, I was but, about to say. You know, maybe maybe they got the box and then their car breaks down. Maybe he's just, just maybe he's just balding. We need to look at his family and history. Maybe that. Let's look at his dad. <laughs> <laughs> Let's it's look at his possible. grandpa. Maybe he just needed an excuse. Maybe. I don't know why I'm stuck on the bald. I don't know either. You're like really <laughs> harping on it. I don't know. Because being bald is okay. <laughs> yes, it is. But that's just like the strangest thing to happen out of all of this. Yes. It's like, oh, my car broke down. Oh, my girlfriend broke up with me. And I'm bald. Like, that's just crazy to me. Yeah. They attributed all their bad luck to the box and it took on those properties. Mm-hmm. So they just kind of poured all their negativity into the box. Like, this is your fault. This is your fault. I could it's see that. Bad. Or maybe it's possible one of the owners at some point had an attachment that attached itself to the box for some reason. Mm. and it's just getting passed down with that same spirit yeah and they're just fueling it yeah or maybe their negative energy summoned something to the box i really don't i've heard stories of something like this from greg and dana newkirk they're paranormal investigators and collectors of haunted things and i think they have a podcast it's called haunted objects like greg and dana newkirk haunted (laughs) objects podcast i think i think i've heard of that um but they've told a story of an object and i think i've received uh, I, i think i've told you this story too they received a haunted object from an overnight janitor. And the yes. janitor claimed that a voice in the woods told him to pour all of his hatred into the box. Yes. The, the voice in the woods was named hatred, I mm-hmm. think. And they, they poured he poured all of his hatred and, and negativity into an object that he created Our, by design from the voice in the woods. Yes. And eventually the object seemed to take on a life of its own and began causing the man serious trouble. And he gave it to Greg and Dana because he's like, I... This is really bad. He tried to kill them, didn't he? He said, like, he it's telling me to. to do bad things. And yeah. so they're like, goodbye. They, I, I, You'll have to go find their their podcast. I think they tell it on their podcast and mm-hmm. some other podcasts. But yeah, it a really interesting story. But they took it. And they also have a painting that they take with them on tour. So they tour with some of their haunted objects. Mm-hmm. And they have a new painting that they tell all of their guests to pour energy into to create an attachment. Or, or in hopes of. It's kind of like an experiment. You know that vine's like, wah, 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 yes. <laughs> yes. That's all I can think about right now. I feel that. But okay, I mean, to each they, their own. They like it. They can handle it. So it's what they like. All right. Then there is an experiment done in the 70s. Um, I don't know what it was called, but it's basically Philip the Ghost Experiment. So a brief overview, and that might be something we look into another time because this is really interesting. I heard it on another podcast. So a group of people got together and they were given a story, a backstory for a fictional person, Philip. Mm-hmm. He lived long ago. He, They knew everything about him. They created like a wife for him, a mistress, uh, like maybe, a I don't know. A backstory. I, yeah, they, they created an entire life and backstory, life and death. Mm-hmm. 
Then they sat together and basically used their minds and energy and talked about Philip and tried to create him to see if they could create a haunting, to create a ghost from their minds. Uh, did they? They say they did. Or did they summon something that already exists and they're like, I could be Philip. That's fine. Exactly. Is what mm. I was thinking. Yeah. But it's very interesting. So if y'all want me to talk about Philip the ghost, I can. I'll, I think there's a book about it. Is it possible to create a haunting given this fictional story? And you're just like, wow. Haunt. Maybe because there's a lot of stories and like Bloody Mary and things like that. Have we just made that all up and made things happen because we wanted it to, we willed it to happen. So it does. Or like you said, there are other spirits that are like, okay, I'll be Philip. I'll be Bloody Mary, you know? So like I said, I ended this with more questions than I would like. <laughs> and I, I would love to hear what the people have to say. As I ended this, I was really looking forward to hear what everyone in the comments has to mm -hmm. say because I have no clue. Those are just my postulations. If anyone wants to expound upon them or give me their opinions, or maybe they know more than us about this, that's definitely possible. We're oh, just yeah. beginners here. Oh, yeah. I'm ready to read the comments already. I, d I know there's going to be some good ones. Mm -hmm. So that is what I have on Dybbuk boxes. But that one story in the cemetery, she brought a Dybbuk box. She had a Dybbuk box. True. She, did she? Did she make? I, mm, summon a demon or some kind of negative spirit into the box? And you can buy Dybbuk boxes. Yeah. I have tons of questions. And none of them can be answered. No. <laughs> or not by me anyway. Because mm. I also have a lot of questions. I think we're asking the same questions. <laughs> okay. Well, let us know. Because I'm very interested, actually. And that is where we will leave you today. Unless you have any more to say? I don't. All I right. have a lot of thoughts. Just go but ponder. I don't, yes. We appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. Follow if you're not following. Subscribe if you're not subscribed yet. And like this video if you liked it. Share us with your friends and ghostly pals. <laughs> Follow us on Instagram at Ghosties Pod. I posted a photo of Petey. And Macy said she'll let him on the pod, by the way. So I will. be on the lookout for Mr. P. If you have a story of your own, you can email us at ghostiespod at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your stories. We've got some special things coming up for October. So... I'm really excited for that. Mm -hmm. And merch is coming. We're working on it. And hopefully, hopefully this week. But we will let you know. We'll post it on Instagram for sure. And then make an announcement in the next video if you're not following on Instagram. We will see you next Monday. Goodbye. Maybe.